Chapter Three of the Iron Heel by Jack London. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Matt Saw. Jackson's Arm. Little did I dream the fateful part Jackson's arm was to play in my life. Jackson himself did not impress me when I hunted him out. I found him in a crazy ramshackle house down near the bay on the edge of the marsh. Pools of stagnant water stood around the house, their surfaces covered with a green and putrid-looking scum, while the stench that arose from them was intolerable. Note. Ramshackle. An adjective descriptive of ruined and dilapidated houses in which great numbers of the working people found shelter in those days. They invariably paid rent, and, considering the value of such houses, enormous rent to the landlords. I found Jackson the meek and lowly man he had been described. He was making some sort of rattan work, and he toiled on stolidly while I talked with him. But in spite of his meekness and lowliness, I fancied I caught the first note of a nascent bitterness in him when he said, They might have given me a job as watchman anyway. Note. In those days thievery was incredibly prevalent. Everybody stole property from everybody else. The lords of society stole legally or else legalized their stealing, while the poorer classes stole illegally. Nothing was safe unless guarded. Enormous numbers of men were employed as watchmen to protect property. The houses of the well-to-do were a combination of safe deposit vault and fortress. The appropriation of the personal belongings of others by our own children of today is looked upon as a rudimentary survival of the theft characteristic that in those early times was universal. I got little out of him. He struck me as stupid, and yet the deafness with which he worked with his one hand seemed to belie his stupidity. This suggested an idea to me. "'How did you happen to get your arm caught in the machine?' I asked. He looked at me in a slow and pondering way and shook his head. "'I don't know. It just happened.' "'Carelessness?' I prompted. "'No,' he answered. "'I ain't for calling it that. I was working overtime, and I guess I was tired out some. I worked seventeen years in them mills, and I've took notice that most of the accidents happens just before whistle-blow. I'm willing to bet that more accidents happens in the hour before whistle-blow than in all the rest of the day.' A man ain't so quick after working steady for hours. I've seen too many of them cut up and gouged and chored not to know. Note. The laborers were called to work and dismissed by savage, screaming, nerve-wracking steam whistles. Many of them? I queried. Hundreds and hundreds, and children, too. With the exception of the terrible details, Jackson's story of his accident was the same as that I had already heard. When I asked him if he had broken some rule of working the machinery, he shook his head. "'I chucked off the belt with my right hand,' he said, "'and made a reach for the flint with my left. "'I didn't stop to see if the belt was off. "'I thought my right hand had done it, only it didn't. "'I reached quick, and the belt wasn't all the way off, "'and then my arm was chewed off.' "'It must have been painful,' I said sympathetically. "'The crunching of the bones wasn't nice,' was his answer. His mind was rather hazy concerning the damage suit. Only one thing was clear to him, and that was that he had not got any damages. He had a feeling that the testimony of the foremen and the superintendent had brought about the adverse decision of the court. Their testimony, as he put it, wasn't what it ought to have been. And to them I resolved to go. One thing was plain. Jackson's situation was wretched. His wife was in ill health, and he was unable to earn, by his rattan work and peddling, sufficient food for the family. He was back in his rent, and the oldest boy, a lad of eleven, had started to work in the mills. "'They might have given me that watchman's job,' were his last words as I went away. By the time I had seen the lawyer who had handled Jackson's case, and the two foremen and the superintendent at the mills who had testified, I began to feel that there was something after all in Ernest's contention. He was a weak and insufficient-looking man, the lawyer, and at sight of him I did not wonder that Jackson's case had been lost— my first thought was that it had served Jackson right for getting such a lawyer. But the next moment two of Ernest's statements came flashing into my consciousness. The company employs very efficient lawyers. And Colonel Ingram is a shrewd lawyer. I did some rapid thinking. It dawned upon me that of course the company could afford finer legal talent than could a working man like Jackson. But this was merely a minor detail. There was some very good reason I was sure why Jackson's case had gone against him. Why did you lose the case? I asked. The lawyer was perplexed and worried for a moment. 
and I found it in my heart to pity the wretched little creature. Then he began to whine. I do believe his whine was congenital. He was a man beaten at birth. He whined about the testimony. The witnesses had given only the evidence that helped the other side. Not one word could he get out of them that would have helped Jackson. They knew which side their bread was buttered on. Jackson was a fool. He had been browbeaten and confused by Colonel Ingram. Colonel Ingram was brilliant at cross-examination. He had made Jackson answer damaging questions. How could his answers be damaging if he had the right on his side? I demanded. What's right got to do with it? He demanded back. You see all those books? He moved his hand over the array of volumes on the walls of his tiny office. All my reading and studying of them has taught me that law is one thing and right is another thing. Ask any lawyer. You go to Sunday school to learn what is right, but you go to those books to learn law. Do you mean to tell me that Jackson had the right on his side and yet was beaten? I queried tentatively. Do you mean to tell me that there is no justice in Judge Caldwell's court? The little lawyer glared at me a moment, and then the belligerence faded out of his face. I hadn't a fair chance, he began whining again. They made a fool out of Jackson and out of me, too. What chance had I? Colonel Ingram is a great lawyer. If he wasn't great, would he have charge of the law business of the Sierra Mills, of the Erston Land Syndicate, of the Berkeley Consolidated, of the Oakland, San Leandro, and Pleasanton Electric? He's a corporation lawyer, and corporation lawyers are not paid for being fools. Note. The function of the corporation lawyer was to serve, by corrupt methods, the money-grabbing propensities of the corporations. It is on record that Theodore Roosevelt, at that time President of the United States, said in 1905 A.D. in his address at Harvard commencement, We all know that, as things actually are, many of the most influential and most highly remunerated members of the bar, in every center of wealth, make it their special task to work out bold and ingenious schemes by which their wealthy clients, individual or corporate, can evade the laws which are made to regulate, in the interests of the public, the uses of great wealth. What do you think the Sierra Mills alone give him $20,000 a year for? Because he's worth $20,000 a year to them, that's what for. I'm not worth that much. If I was, I wouldn't be on the outside, starving and taking cases like Jackson's. What do you think I'd have got if I'd won Jackson's case? You'd have robbed him, most probably, I answered. Of course I would, he cried angrily. I've got to live, haven't I? Note. A typical illustration of the internecine strife that permeated all society. Men preyed upon one another like ravening wolves. The big wolves ate the little wolves, and in the social pack Jackson was one of the least of the little wolves. "'He has a wife and children,' I chided. "'So have I a wife and children,' he retorted. "'And there's not a soul in this world except myself that cares whether they starve or not.' His face suddenly softened, and he opened his watch and showed me a small photograph of a woman and two little girls pasted inside the case. There they are. Look at them. We've had a hard time. A hard time. I had hoped to send them away to the country if I'd won Jackson's case. They're not healthy here, but I can't afford to send them away. When I started to leave, he dropped back into his whine. I hadn't the ghost of a chance. Colonel Ingram and Judge Coldwell are pretty friendly. I'm not saying that if I'd got the right kind of testimony out of their witnesses on cross-examination, that friendship would have decided the case. And yet I must say that Judge Caldwell did a whole lot to prevent my getting that very testimony. Why, Judge Caldwell and Colonel Ingram belong to the same lodge and the same club. They live in the same neighborhood, one I can't afford. And their wives are always in and out of each other's houses. They're always having whist parties and such things back and forth. And yet you think Jackson had the right of it? I asked, pausing for the moment on the threshold. I don't think I know it, was his answer. And at first I thought he had some show, too, but I didn't tell my wife. I didn't want to disappoint her. She had her heart set on a trip to the country, hard enough as it was. Why did you not call attention to the fact that Jackson was trying to save the machinery from being injured? I asked Peter Donnelly, one of the four men who had testified at the trial. He pondered a long time before replying. Then he cast an anxious look about him and said, Because I've a good wife and three of the sweetest children ye ever laid eyes on, that's why. I do not understand, I said. In other words, because it wouldn't have been healthy, he answered. You mean... I began, but he interrupted passionately. I mean what I said. It's long years I've worked in the mills. I began as a little lad on the spindles. I worked up ever since. It's by hard work I got to my present exalted position. I'm a foreman, if you please, and I doubt me if there's a man in the mills that put out a hand to drag me from drowning. 
I used to belong to the Union, but I've stayed by the company through two strikes. They called me Scab. There's not a man among them today to take a drink with me if I asked him. Do you see the scars on my head where I was struck with flying bricks? There ain't a child at the spindles but what would curse me name. Me only friend is the company. It's not me duty, but me bread and butter and the life of me children to stand by the mills. That's why. Was Jackson to blame? I asked. He should have got the damages. He was a good worker and never made trouble. Then you were not at liberty to tell the whole truth, as you had sworn to do. He shook his head. The truth? The whole truth and nothing but the truth? I said solemnly. Again his face became impassioned and he lifted it, not to me but to heaven. I'd let my soul and body burn in everlasting hell for them children of mine, was his answer. Henry Dallas, the superintendent, was a vulpine-faced creature who regarded me insolently and refused to talk. Not a word could I get from him concerning the trial and his testimony. But with the other foreman I had better luck. James Smith was a hard-faced man, and my heart sank as I encountered him. He, too, gave me the impression that he was not a free agent. As we talked, I began to see that he was mentally superior to the average of his kind. He agreed with Peter Donnelly that Jackson should have got damages— and he went farther and called the action heartless and cold-blooded that had turned the worker adrift after he had been made helpless by the accident. Also, he explained that there were many accidents in the mills, and that the company's policy was to fight to the bitter end all consequent damage suits. "'It means hundreds of thousands a year to the stockholders,' he said. And as he spoke, I remembered the last dividend that had been paid my father, and the pretty gown for me and the books for him that had been bought out of that dividend. I remembered Ernest's charge that my gown was stained with blood— and my flesh began to crawl underneath my garments. When you testified at the trial, you didn't point out that Jackson received his accident through trying to save the machinery from damage, I said. No, I did not, was the answer, and his mouth set bitterly. I testified to the effect that Jackson injured himself by neglect and carelessness, and that the company was not in any way to blame or liable. Was it carelessness? I asked. Go at that or anything you want to call it. The fact is, a man gets tired after he's been working for hours. I was becoming interested in the man. He certainly was of a superior kind. You are better educated than most working men, I said. I went through high school, he replied. I worked my way through doing janitor work. I wanted to go through the university, but my father died, and I came to work in the mills. I wanted to become a naturalist, he explained shyly, as though confessing a weakness. I love animals, but I came to work in the mills. When I was promoted to foreman, I got married. Then the family came, and, well, I wasn't my own boss any more. What do you mean by that? I asked. I was explaining why I testified at the trial the way I did, why I followed instructions. Whose instructions? Colonel Ingram. He outlined the evidence I was to give. And it lost Jackson's case for him. He nodded and the blood began to rise darkly in his face. And Jackson had a wife and two children dependent on him. I know, he said quietly, though his face was growing darker. Tell me, I went on, was it easy to make yourself over from what you were, say in high school, to the man you must have become to do such a thing at the trial? The suddenness of his outburst startled and frightened me. He ripped out a savage oath and clenched his fist as though about to strike me. Note. It is interesting to note the virilities of language that were common speech in that day, as indicative of the life, red of claw and fang, that was then lived. References here made, of course, not to the oath of Smith, but to the verb ripped used by Avis Everhard. "'I beg your pardon,' he said the next moment. "'No, it was not easy. And now I guess you can go away. You've got all you wanted out of me, but let me tell you this before you go. It won't do you any good to repeat anything I've said.' I'll deny it, and there are no witnesses. I'll deny every word of it. And if I have to, I'll do it under oath on the witness stand. After my interview with Smith, I went to my father's office in the chemistry building and there encountered Ernest. It was quite unexpected, but he met me with his bold eyes and firm handclasp, and with that curious blend of his awkwardness and ease. It was as though our last stormy meeting was forgotten, but I was not in the mood to have it forgotten. "'I have been looking up Jackson's case,' I said abruptly. He was all interested attention, and waited for me to go on, though I could see in his eyes the certitude that my convictions had been shaken. 
He seems to have been badly treated, I confessed. I... I think some of his blood is dripping from our roof beams. Of course, he answered. If Jackson and all his fellows were treated mercifully, the dividends would not be so large. I shall never be able to take pleasure in pretty gowns again, I added. I felt humble and contrite, and was aware of a sweet feeling that Ernest was a sort of father confessor. Then, as ever after, his strength appealed to me. It seemed to radiate a promise of peace and protection. Nor will you be able to take pleasure in sackcloth, he said gravely. There are the jute mills, you know, and the same thing goes on there. It goes on everywhere. Our boasted civilization is based upon blood, soaked in blood, and neither you nor I nor any of us can escape the scarlet stain. The men you talked with, who were they? I told him all that had taken place. And not one of them was a free agent, he said. They were all tied to the merciless industrial machine, and the pathos of it and the tragedy is that they are tied by their heartstrings, their children, always the young life that is their instinct to protect. This instinct is stronger than any ethic they possess. My father, he lied, he stole, he did all sorts of dishonorable things to put bread into my mouth and into the mouths of my brothers and sisters. He was a slave to the industrial machine, and it stamped his life out, worked him to death. But you, I interjected. You are surely a free agent. Not wholly, he replied. I am not tied by my heartstrings. I am often thankful that I have no children, and I dearly love children. Yet if I married, I should not dare to have any. That surely is bad doctrine, I cried. I know it is, he said sadly. But it is expedient doctrine. I'm a revolutionist, and it is a perilous vocation. I laughed incredulously. If I tried to enter your father's house at night to steal his dividends from the Sierra Mills, what would he do? He sleeps with a revolver on the stand by the bed, I answered. He would most probably shoot you. And if I and a few others should lead a million and a half men into the houses of all the well-to-do, there would be a great deal of shooting, wouldn't there? Note. This reference is to the socialist vote cast in the United States in 1910. The rise of this vote clearly indicates the swift growth of the party of revolution. Its voting strength in the United States in 1888 was 2,068. In 1902, 127,713. In 1904, 435,040. In 1908, 1,108,427. And in 1910, 1,688,211. Note 2. Yes, but you're not going to do that, I objected. It is precisely what I'm doing, and we intend to take not the mere wealth in the houses, but all the sources of that wealth, all the mines, and railroads, and factories, and banks, and stores. That is the revolution. It is truly perilous. There will be more shooting, I'm afraid, than even I dream of. But, as I was saying, no one today is a free agent. We are all caught up in the wheels and cogs of the industrial machine. You found that you were, and that the men you talked with were. Talk with more of them. Go and see Colonel Ingram. Look up the reporters that kept Jackson's case out of the papers and the editors that run the papers. You will find them all slaves of the machine. A little later in our conversation, I asked him a simple little question about the liability of working men to accidents, and received a statistical lecture in return. It is all in the books, he said. The figures have been gathered, and it has been proved conclusively that accidents rarely occur in the first hours of the morning work, but that they increase rapidly in the succeeding hours as the workers grow tired and slower in both their muscular and mental processes. Why, do you know that your father has three times as many chances for safety of life and limb than has a working man? He has. The insurance companies know. Note. In the terrible wolf struggle of those centuries, no man was permanently safe, no matter how much wealth he amassed. Out of fear for the welfare of their families, men devised the scheme of insurance. To us, in this intelligent age, such a device is laughably absurd and primitive. But in that age, insurance was a very serious matter. The amusing part of it is that the funds of the insurance companies were frequently plundered and wasted by the very officials who were entrusted with the management of them. They will charge him $4.20 a year on a $1,000 accident policy, and for the same policy they will charge a labor of $15. "'And you?' I asked, and in the moment of asking I was aware of a solicitude that was something more than slight. "'Oh,' 
"'As a revolutionist, I have about eight chances to the working man's one of being injured or killed,' he answered carelessly. "'The insurance companies charge the highly trained chemists that handle explosives eight times what they charge the working men. I don't think they'd insure me at all. Why did you ask?' My eyes fluttered, and I could feel the blood warm in my face. It was not that he had caught me in my solicitude, but that I had caught myself and in his presence. Just then my father came in and began making preparations to depart with me. Ernest returned some books he had borrowed and went away first. But just as he was going, he turned and said, "'Oh, by the way, while you are ruining your own peace of mind and I am ruining the bishops, you'd better look up Mrs. Wixon and Mrs. Pertonwaith. Their husbands, you know, are the two principal stockholders in the mills. Like all the rest of humanity, those two women are tied to the machine, but they are so tied that they sit on top of it.' End of chapter 3 Recording by Matt Saw, Montreal, mattsaw.org.